excellent to you. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we sing songs without applying it to meaning. And then we rest on the melody and the harmonization. And we don't attribute the praise where it's due. Where then we attribute it to the voices and not to the God that we serve. But I want you to think past the way it sounded and apply it to how it felt the moment that the Lord rescued you from a circumstance. Yes. Yes. If there's a believer that recognizes that the Lord has done something for them, I want you to stand on your feet. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to ask you to claim something in victory, yes. in advance for something. If you believe that God has done something for you, then indeed was something that was extraordinary. I want you to just bow your heads with me. Let's pray together. Father, today, the praises have gone up. The blessings need to come down. Yeah. Do something for us, O oh Lord, that is greater than ourselves. Help us, O oh Lord, to hear what you have to say. Remove all distractions. Give us, O oh God, a confidence that you are a God that sits high, but you look low. And that you care about the circumstances of your people. There are some people who came in here with some baggage, with some issues, with some hard-pressed situations. That only you, O oh God, have the ability to restore and to allow them to overcome it. God, give them a word that will allow them to see where their help comes from. Give them a confidence of knowing what their identity is. And then when it's all said and done in the end, let us leave here saying it was good to be in the house of the living God. Yeah. Grant us these things in Jesus' name. say it's good to see some new faces here. My Jen, uh, welcome. Uh, this is your first or your second time. We're thankful that you have allowed our little home to be your place of worship today. And uh, you, you might hear something uh, going around, this little word is called war. Uh, and let me just let you know, uh, let me just keep you in on the little hidden secret. Uh, My Jen, we are a church at war. And what that means is we are a church that wants to welcome you, to affirm you, and to recruit you to the kingdom of the Lord. Amen. And so if you have a member of my gen that have not, has not welcomed you yet, has not affirmed you yet, has not found a reason to recruit you, please report them and their name to me by the end of today. Because we are in a culture of uh, building up the kingdom of, of God, not just um, the, the, the members of the church, but just building up the souls for the kingdom uh, of the Lord. Uh, for those people who also, if this is not your first time here, uh, we are a church that are is really into the studying of the word of God. We really like to study our word, and so we are actually in this uh, series where we've been looking at the book of Hebrews. And today, we're actually looking at, if you can believe this, if you can believe when we started this book of Hebrews, we're actually coming up to the end. Today and next week will be the end of our Hebrew series. And we're looking at, finally, the final uh, bits and portions of uh, the study. And so we pray that it was, been, for those who have been here, who have been listening to it, who has been a blessing to you. And we pray that if you are just jumping on to this road, that hopefully you, you won't get lost. And we'll try our best to try to get you up to speed as to where uh, we are right now. Before that, let me uh, give you a story. Uh, to kind of set some uh, context into where we are. Hopefully this works. I don't know if it does or if it doesn't. Uh-oh. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, okay, wonderful. Word, wonderful. Story time. So there was a, um, there was a missionary who went to uh, a country where they did not see people uh, of a particular hue. <laughs> and when, they, when the, the, the missionary got there, uh, there were a lot of children playing, and there were a lot of people doing their day-to-day -day business. And this one missionary uh, saw a, a little girl uh, playing in the field. 
and the girl was very inquisitive about this person that she'd never seen before. And uh, the missionary was trying to gain glances at the girl, trying to find a way, an excuse for them to play, sort of a way to uh, soften his approach to, to her. And every single time she would look at him and she would kind of laugh, thinking that he's making funny faces. And every time she would turn back to her mother, as her mother's watching, and sort of get an affirmation from her mom, is this okay? And her mom would kind of give her a look saying, yeah, it's okay, keep going. And she would, okay, and she would turn back to the missionary and they would continue to keep trying to um, pass off, you know, external exchanges of communication. And lo and behold, within five minutes, a, a relationship that was not even created was now um, built up to this wonderful playing um, intercourse to the point that now uh, uh, the girl who was once playing in the field is now right in the missionary space as they're playing and as they are running and as they're enjoying each other's company. Today, as we look at the book of Hebrews, we're at Hebrews chapter 12. We're at Hebrews chapter 12 at the end of the chapter, verses 25. I want you to open your Bible your Bible apps <laughs> with me um, to, to that chapter. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 to 29. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 to 29. When you have it, say amen. amen. For those who don't have it, pray the Lord. The Lord is good. It's on the screen. <laughs> The Bible says, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Oof, Paul, you're, you're being very bold here in your declaration here in this final part of this chapter. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now, he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is what? Consuming. Is a consuming fire. Here's this bold conclusion that Paul is wrapping up in this whole dissertation that he's giving to people who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's coming to this conclusion and saying, okay, we just finished this whole thing about faith. We talked about how Jesus was the, the high priest by the order of Melchizedek, how he, he works in the heavenly sanctuary that patterned the earthly sanctuary that you Hebrews appreciate, how he is God that turned man for our sake and that by faith we have a connection to him and thus are partakers of this wonderful promise that he has done for us. All of these different things. Now that I've brought to conclusion this idea, please don't refuse him who speaks. Please don't refuse him. If they did not escape, who's the they? Your forefathers. If your forefathers did not escape did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we refuse what is being said here today? Remember, those the people, those days were the people who weren't able to enter into the kingdom of God because of their lack of faith. Faith was the key in order for them to enter into the kingdom of God, into the promised land. And because of the spies that they sent in and the report that came back to them, they were a little weary about what they heard and so they left. Remember, the, the journey from Egypt to the promised land was one week. And they literally got there in one week, six days. And by the time they were about to enter on the seventh day, oh, I wish I had time, on the seventh day into their rest, 
they were turned back because of their lack of faith. And so a whole generation spent how many years in the wilderness, wandering through the wilderness because they weren't able to enter in by their faith. And so the next generation was able to enter in because of the faith that they had. Please do not forget, believers, as you're trying to practice this church thing, to not try to do this without understanding how much faith is required. Faith is a huge part, if not the essential part, to your Christianity. You can't fake this thing for too long. Eventually, you're, you're faking it till you make it. We'll catch up to you. You can't fake this thing. And that's why you know I kind of like an atmosphere where you have a person that can come to church dressed all fancy and today, and you can have another person that come through just regularly casual and chilling because you don't have to worry about that because you're not, it's not, you're not at a place where you have to put on this form of godliness while denying the power thereof. Best believe I wish I was in my tent right now, but I was another church I preached before here, so you know, it is what it is, culture. Anyway, so, so recognize it. So they said that they is the, the generation of the past, right? He said, don't escape. Don't be like the mistake that they made and not escape. So watch this. Verse 26. At that time, his voice shook the earth. At that time. But now he, he is also promised. Once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also what? The heavens. The words once more indicates what? That the removing of what can be shaken, that is the created things, so that what? The things that cannot be shaken will what? Okay, so, so save me here for a second. So the declaration that Paul is saying here is that there's going to be a shaking again. You recognize the shaking before. There's going to be a shaking again. And the purpose of the shaking is important for us to understand because it's going to separate who is really of God and who's not. And you're going to come to a real re 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 revelation, a real understanding of realizing who's actually on God's side, Hebrews. You think that you're on God's side because of the rituals that you practice. But the shaking is going to show you that the people of God aren't standing based on how well they practice their rituals, but based on how much faith and relationship they had with God. There's going to be a shaking. There was a shaking before. It's going to mirror that type of shaking. There was a shaking before that allowed there to be a separation between the standards of God and those that are not the standards of God. Let me help somebody to understand what the standards of God are. See, a lot of times people equate Holiness to godliness. Right? In order for me to be godly, I need to be holy. But do you know that holiness is not godliness? Holiness is the response to godliness. That godliness is not actually holiness, but godliness is actually relationship. That, 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 that in order for you to be like God, you need to be in relationship. We were created in the image of God. And so we ourselves were created to have relationship. And so the three in one, that type of idea where three can be one, that idea is godly. And thus because of the relationship that they have, their response to their relationship accordingly now begins to have holiness. Because of the relationship I have with you, I respond to you in a way that's deep to the relationship that I have with you. Thus, think about this, think about this. That's why, that's why the law of God, the way that we find true holiness, the, the standards of God, is really merited in two things. The law of God is two things. One, love God and love your neighbor. And how you practice that is a response to how you have relationship with them. And so what's going to separate the people of God is not the actions that you do. It's going to be the relationship that you have. There's going to be a shaking. There was a shaking before that separated God's standard from an earthly standard. God's way from our way. And once again, it will happen for the people of God. Therefore, verse 28, since we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Hold on for a second. Right before it, it says, so that after the shaking, the things that will remain will be the things that cannot be shaken. 
Let's talk about the shaking. Somebody, somebody volunteer to look up the first verse for me. Who, who's going to volunteer to look up the first verse? All right, got the first verse. And Justina's going to get the second verse. All right? First verse is Haggai. Yeah, I know. That's a book in the Bible, right? Crazy. Haggai. <laughs> Haggai chapter 2, right? Haggai chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. Haggai chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. It is not on the screen. So sorry. <laughs> that blessing did not afford to you. Haggai chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. When you have it, say amen. 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 Most, um, enough people have it. Go ahead. What does it say? Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. Now understand that this declaration of the shaking is sort of familiar to what is being said here. There's a shaking, but what is being shaken? The standards of the Gentiles versus the standards of God's people. I'm going to tear down your kingdoms. You know the book of Isaiah speaks of, 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 of a kingdom or of a mountain that's going to sit on top of a mountain. And basically the mountain is a, a, is a poetic way and a prophetic way in the Bible that it speaks of kingdoms. And God's kingdom will eventually will sit on top of all kingdoms. His way, his standard of life is going to sit on top of all the standards of life. And you are going to treat people the way God treats you eventually after the shaking. Because one day, soon and very soon, there won't be any backbiting. There won't be any jealousy. There won't be any maliciousness. There won't be any people to be talking about you behind your back. There won't be any enviness or, or coveting. There are going to be people who actually love you for the sake of who you are. And when they talk up to you and they say hello to you, they actually care about what you're going to say to them. It's the standard of God. It's what God is eventually going to create. Well, what was the second verse? Second verse, Revelation chapter 12. Verses 7 to 10. It says, uh, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He, cast, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Hold on for a second. Question to some, some faithful church goers. When does this happen? In the beginning. In the, in the beginning. When, when, when in the beginning? Like the very, very beginning. So the war that happened in heaven where Satan was cast down, you're saying is at the beginning of time. Before the earth was created. How many people believe that? If you believe that, raise your hand. Some people are not going to raise their hand for the sake of just not being wrong. Some people are just like, you, well, you're going to preach it anyway. So. <laughs> you're going to be caught out there. Better get messed up. Think about this. Think about this. Read verse 10 again. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom, kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the cues of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night have been cast down. Now, question, question, question. Is verse 10 a, 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 a response to the action that happened in the casting down? I believe that. Would you, would you say that? I believe Like, in other words, now we have salvation. Yeah. Based on what? Based on the fact that somebody was cast out. Yeah. Would we say that? Yes or no? Yeah. No. Why not? Because, I mean, you got salvation through Christ. So. Right. So when he died and Jesus sacrificed, that's when we got salvation. And so then the better question then is, if we got salvation when Christ died, then technically, the war in heaven didn't happen in the beginning of time. It happened when Christ won the victory. What? Think about this. Why would I be saved before there was sin? For 
from the foundation of the earth. And oh, that's a good say that one more time. From the foundation of the earth, the land was slain. And what's the foundation? The thing that can't be shaken. My whoa. My okay, I'm so ah, y'all. Yeah, this, 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 this is deep right here. This went right over your head, right here. So, so, so recognize this. The foundation that the earth was built on is not rock. Come on. It's Bring not on. the water. The foundation that the earth was built on was the standard of God. Yeah. <laughs> and so to have salvation from what was tainted with came through Jesus you know that's the reason why in the book of Job we studied this a little earlier in Hebrews that's the reason why in the book of Job remember Job is after the creation right after, well after the creation you still see that the devil had access to heaven that's right. so he couldn't have been cast out he still had access to go there and so there was a constant back and forth with the devil going back and forth to heaven until he was cast out. So, okay, so are you saying that when Jesus died and resurrected, he won? And Correct. And he went back to heaven? Correct. God was like, okay, Satan, you can't. That's it. Both. It's over. Give me a black heart. That's it. That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, okay. okay. Correct. Adam lost, Jesus Correct. Satan didn't have that. And you, you no longer have that access because remember, remember, Satan took, we talked we about this, Satan took the keys from Adam to be the representative for mankind. But now I've done finished. I've done what I needed to do to become the second Adam. So give me the keys. Get out the door. So that's why Satan is mad at Jesus. <laughs> well, I would say there's a lot of reasons why Satan is mad at Jesus. But yes, that's one of the many few. So, so, so recognize this. So recognize this. So this shaking we have seen before. Uh -huh. A shaking that disturbs the kingdoms and its mentality. A shaking that disturbs the salvation. Recognize it's important for us to know that the shaking that we once seen is also a shaking that we will see. And it's a warning for us, it's a recognition for us to be able to let a world know there's a shaking coming. Let me tell you what I'm, I, I got really, really upset with the church about. So growing up in the church, I have been very disappointed I've been very disappointed, especially when it was crusade time. Some of you may, may not even know what crusade is. It pretty much it's a series, it's an evangelistic series, a meeting um, that they had during the week where they would cut quasi. <laughs> so, so you would come together in the church and you'd have a preacher, an evangelist that would come and would really teach some Bible truths and things like that. And eventually, after the series is over, they would have a series of baptisms based on the teachings that they had. And so I remember growing up in church, I would go into church on a Tuesday, you know, whenever they had service, and I would sit down, and they, they would deliberately turn off all the lights, and they would turn on the slideshow. And at that time, they didn't have no projectors. They, they, they had actually the sheets where you put it on the... Come on, come on, say it And they, they, they put it on, and the light just reflected in a way. It projected onto the screen. I'm telling my age here. And so, and so it re re reflected onto the screen. And everybody sat there and watched. And I remember sitting there, and I used to see images of dragons and um, lions with seven heads. Um, I would see some things with horns and teeth and blood. And I'm kind of saying to myself, is this church? <laughs> I don't know about you. I mean, without taking the theology into it, just, just, just imagine you a visitor. You come in. You're just trying to understand this thing. And the first thing they want to do to a person to try to accept them into faith, they, they begin to start to show you images of all of these different beasts and what these beasts mean. <laughs> and so I would hear them talk. God have mercy. And then all, it would climax by basically saying, so you better give your life to Jesus. 
Or you going to die. And you know what? It worked. Many people threw themselves, God, Lord, don't get me into that pool. Many people. We baptized so many people. But the problem is, is that the standards and the foundations of the kingdom of God can never be built on fear. And so that's the reason why there are many people who entered into the church without a true understanding of how to, to, to find the beauty of church because all you found was the fear of church. And eventually, the line, don't get me wrong here, I still believe it, but that line that says Jesus Christ is coming soon eventually played out for you. Because that first line created fear. And it kept a motivation for me to fake it till I make it. To try to create a, an external form of godliness so that for some weird reason somebody can say that I'm going to heaven. And then eventually when the, you know, the 80s passed, the, the 90s passed, and the 2000s, and now we are, good, are we're in the 20s. We're in the roaring, roaring 20s. Can you believe that? Right? So, so, so eventually people started to realize, hey, you know what? You know, I'm going to go back to my old life. And the, and the reason is, because I believe that the, the last day message was not preached right. Yeah. I believe that it was preached as a gimmick. Mercy. Rather than something that was necessary. And the reason is, is because we focus way too much on the things that would negatively happen to those who don't believe rather than the positive things that happens to those who do believe. You know, the fact is, for anybody who's still in fear of that book called Revelation, you know that all the things that are said in Revelation are just for your FYI? Do you know that none of these things apply to those who believe? So all that fire and brimstone means absolutely nothing to you. It's just something for you to know. But you don't have to worry about that type of thing because you are in Jesus. Amen. Wall, it's brick, but it's not. <laughs> Sorry, I was long there. I'm in the zone. So, 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 so recognize this. And so I believe that there needs to be a better way of presenting the last day message. And the best way to present the last day message isn't through fear, it's through love. Yes. And so, it's through the relationship that one has with God and one has with people that you prepare yourself for the last days. You know, the reality is, is that many of us, we don't, we've never been taught, we've been taught a whole lot of things, but church has never taught us how to have a relationship with God. Literally how to be open, how to cry out to God. When is the right time to ask and to not ask and these type of things. There's, not, there's never been an example of proper godliness. Okay, godliness is relationship that produces holiness. There's never been a right form of godliness in church. And so for a last day church, it's important for us to set the example of what the, 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 the earth was created on, and that's relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there's going to be a shaking, and everything that the world has created, every standard that the world has created, will fall. Yeah. Yeah. To only keep what is remaining the thing that cannot be moved. Somebody read this um, quote from my girl Ellen. The people of the world are worshiping false gods. They are to be turned from their false worship, not by hearing denunciation of their idols, hmm. but by beholding something better. Wow. God's goodness is to be made known. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. The Lord desires us to appreciate the great plan of redemption, wow. to realize our high privilege as the children of God, 
and to walk before him in the obedience. Based on the relationship, now we can walk in obedience. Amen. So, so recognize this, recognize this. My girl Ellen puts a nice little spin and it really articulates this point here. That the world will not be changed mm -hmm. based on you calling them out for how in which they live their life. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 You are wrong. Yeah. You're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. All this wrong, 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 wrong. They're never going to change. They're not going to be changed based on you telling them about their false idols. They're going to be changed by you holding something better. God's goodness, this is not me, so this is, this is my girl Ellen. My girl Ellen says, God's goodness is to be made known. Don't, don't, let that, don't, don't let that be too lofty. Bring that down. God's goodness is the thing that needs to be made known. Right, right. Now don't seven heaven, yeah, heads. God's goodness is to be made known. Ye are whose witnesses? God's witnesses. You are God's witnesses, saith the Lord, that what? You have to be a witness that I'm God. But what is God? God is relationship. I'll shout myself. I don't care. That's good. I have to be a witness of who God is, but how can I be a witness of who God is if I don't have relationship with Him? Yes. Nor do I have relationship with my neighbor. Yes. My gen, my gen, my gen, my gen. What's going to make us a peculiar people? Yes. What's going to make us a church that's different? Yes. It's not the way in which we worship. It's the way in which we have relationship. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Do you know? Do you know? I'm just gonna be very candid because I can do that in the past. Um, you know? You, you know? Do you know how many people have tried this? Yeah. Do you know how many people have tried this my gen thing? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in the in the way in which we do it, but you know how many people have tried to be the next big thing? Yep. And you know how many people have failed to meet that mark? Mm -hmm. Because they've rooted their actions in activity mm -hmm. and productivity mm -hmm. rather than relationship and communion with the person that's sitting next to them? Mm -hmm. Do you know that there are so many people who have who come to church and can care, actually who can care less how well the music sounds. Yep. They actually just came because their heart was broken and they needed somebody to ask them how their day was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some people are like, yeah, get out of here, I like my music. <laughs> but, but, but the reality is, is that church is more than this. Sorry about this, you guys are good today though. Um, but it's, 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 it's more than this. You can, yo, yo, you can have church without this. Why? Why, Pascal? Why? I said we're the church. Because we're the church. Yeah. Church is not a building. Right. <laughs> <laughs> last thing I'm out of here. Last thing I'm out of here. <laughs> Question. Why do we shape things? We don't like them. <laughs> Mix it up. Don't like them. For best results. Best results. It's a cultural thing. To mix. It depends on what you're shaking. It depends on what you're shaking. <laughs> you're a teacher. I can see that. It's true. It depends on what you're shaking. If I say because we're not. So you cut the beard. Oh, good lord, of course, I, I just noticed that. Oh, you look a lot, you look a lot younger, like you're like, look at those wolves, look at those wolves, look at them. This is precious. All right, so let's go. So, 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 I'm in a song, I'm sorry. So check this out, check this out. It depends on what you're 
shaking. In the context of what we're talking about, what is God trying to shake? Us. Us. And so if I'm trying to, sh if I shake a person, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get their attention. I'm trying to wake them up. The shaking is waking a people up and surprising them with your love. You know how you are going to be my peculiar people, especially in this city, especially in this community, is to love people. In a city that will curse you out, God has called for you to love people. God has called for you to care about their circumstances. God has called for you when the benediction is done and we're ready to eat, to stick around and have conversation with people. Because Psalms 62, last verse, last verse. Psalm 62. Just giving you text here. Just giving you text. Psalm 62, verses 5 and 6. Somebody read it for me. Psalm 62, 5 and 6. Real quick, real quick, real quick, 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 quick. Help me try to try to the plane. Psalm 62. Psalm 62. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Mm -hmm. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Amen. Can somebody read it in the NIV? That's it. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope, uh, my hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. And so the fact is, is that when you're standing on the rock, Though everything will fight against you, you will not be moved. Though an entire community might reject this, you know we are intentional about keeping these windows open? Do you know as a church that we don't care about how many people come and see us in worship? We are enthusiastic about them seeing us in the middle of our worship. We have to be a people that's confident on where we stand. And so this last day message is simple. There's going to be a shaking. And the kingdom of God will be established. And it will be established based on the love that we have for one another and how we treat people based on the love we have for them. The question for you today is, do you love people the way you should? If the shaking comes today, where would you stand? Are you standing hard on the fact that you are here at church today? Or are you standing strong on the reality of the commitment that you're making to the Lord of loving Him and loving others? As we wrap up Hebrews next week, my call for my church is to be a peculiar people. And to do things that people will look at you and think that you're crazy. And that's love people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a standard that will not be moved. We're thankful that you have established your kingdom and your kingdom is built on love. We're thankful that the church was also established on that foundation. As Peter de 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 declared that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We thank you that you have given us a purpose that we can go and transform the world. We pray, Lord, that this decree, this reminder of a shaking 
would be a, a call for us to wake up, to play, plant our feet on solid ground, to reflect godliness. That's not holiness, but a relationship. That through that relationship will produce holiness. Do for us, O oh God, the things that we need and keep our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. Pray for someone here who has not made a decision all the way to accept you, that they would find a reason for them to choose you. Make them uncomfortable, God. Help them to be called to come and talk to somebody. Come to see me, see any one of the leaders, and make a decision for their life. There's some people who backslide, some people who just turned away from you because the way in which you were presented was out of order. God, I pray that they don't set the baby out with the bathwater. But then they can see you for who you are and who you're calling for them to be. Save us in your kingdom. We pray these things.